That's an amazing Crazy, story. It, it's 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 mind blowing. Is that most of that story captured in this? Uh, and it, and this is the ESPN produced documentary, Youngstown Boys. Yeah, that, every, every dedicated every. under fire. Boom. March in Ohio can only mean two things. Bitter cold and the return of a true strength tradition. The Barbell Shrug team has ventured to Frosty Columbus, home to a multi-sport fitness event as big and bold as its legendary namesake. This is the Arnold Sports Festival, a massive four-day event that plays host to more than 50 competitions, 18,000 athletes, nearly 200,000 avid fitness fans, and of course, some of the biggest names in strength. We've come to town to give you a taste of the madness. Weightlifting, bodybuilding, strongman, crossfit, endurance, and physique. Whatever your industry, passion, or fetish, you can find a 100 gram dose of it right here. There's no greater circus showcase of strength and fitness in the entire world. The lights are bright, the stage is set, and we are all oiled up and ready. It's time for Barbell Shrug, baby. Welcome to the Arnold. <laughs> We're going to lose consciousness on the couch. <laughs> Welcome to Barbell Shrug. I'm Mike Bledsoe. I'm sitting here with Chris Moore uh, and our new co-host, <laughs> AJ Roberts. Uh, and we have CTB behind the camera along with uh, Charlotte. We have traveled up to Columbus, Ohio to the Arnold Sports Festival, um, as we try to do most years. And we're sitting here uh, with Maurice Claret. He uh, played for Ohio State, uh, Denver Broncos. And uh, has a national championship at Ohio State, yeah? Yes. Yeah. I remember watching it. I was still playing ball. I, mean, I heard Ohio State football is pretty good. Yeah, they won, all right. they, yeah, they won right. a championship again this year. So. Yeah, I had yeah. to warn Maurice uh, ahead of time. I'm not much of a sports fan myself. <laughs> I was like, you start talking football, I'll just nod. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Like I got to do it at the barber shop. Right? <laughs> <laughs> they're like cutting my hair every time I was sports. I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're, they're really fast, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you have a really amazing story. Uh, you, uh, you played football, went pro, and then you spent some time in prison. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then came back out of that and made some huge changes and are really thriving now. Uh, yes. I guess just take it away. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't, well, it, it, where did your – because you were obviously – well, your high school career at Ohio is probably really big time. You entered yes. Ohio State as a, a blue chip prospect, right? Yes, I uh, entered Ohio State. Well, I, when, I, when I graduated high school, I was the number one rated football player in the world. Damn. Um, yeah, so. Uh, and just so people know, that's not the easiest thing to accomplish. Yeah, just I, I, I always say, I humbly say, you know, I was, I was blessed. We was on a real good team. I uh, had a real great coach. Uh, but anything that you could want to accomplish in, in regards to high school football, I accomplished. Ran for a bunch of yards, a bunch of touchdowns. Uh, and at that moment, in that moment of time, it was, it was a big deal in Ohio because I was the biggest thing in football, and LeBron was the biggest thing in basketball. Well, you guys were to come up at the same time, eh? Yeah, right, we, let's we, move this mic just a, just little, a little closer. closer. Oh, yeah, I think it'd be okay. Good. Uh, yeah. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Yeah, so we're, we're basically 30 minutes away from each other. Damn. And uh, when I would sell out stadiums with 25,000 people for football, uh, he would do the same thing. For, for a high school football game. High school football game. Yeah, Jesus. Uh, uh, back there, so I think I love this because, like, all eyes were on you coming out of high school. And obviously, the, the from that, you know, your destiny was kind of laid out for you. Yes. Right? And uh, when you were coming out of high school, going into Ohio State, um, did you think, like, because because I know like part of that like, you wanted to jump to the NFL, like did you plan that from high school? Is that because seeing LeBron do that do that go Was straight that to vision? the N NBA? Did you kind of think like well, why can't I do the same thing? Uh, no, I, I can kind of walk you through that progression. So uh, I come out of high school, and I never thought that I would go and even start at Ohio State. I knew I can come down and compete, and I knew I was a hard worker. So those things kind of um, th those things were like my competitive advantage, so to speak. Uh, so I got to Ohio State, and once I started to train harder, once I started to be more focused on the game and understand the game and start to slow down, I started to realize that my natural talent was just better than a lot of, a lot of other guys. Uh, and, and my skill set or my competitive advantage was always running people over. Uh, I never had uh, skill 
angles to move around guys yeah, around straight yeah. through people. It's beautiful to watch. Yeah, I mean, that's and my favorite thing. job. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. People I, falling I, down, I'm flapping like, around. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't have wanted to try to tackle you. But I tell you like this, in, in, in respects to just we're in a fitness arena, right? I, I, as a freshman, I was benching 430. Damn. I was, yeah, I was squatting. Wow. What was your body weight? Uh, I was 238 at the time. So I was benching 430, squatting 870, and hand cleaning about 340. What the fuck? Oh my God. You squatted what? Yeah. 870. Uh, and your body weight is two, Jesus. 230. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a big talk, you know, the, the, obviously being yeah. a strength athlete. That's what we, God, we heard wait. those numbers. We were like, that I, is I think that's, a, that's like an important point right there. People who are in the fitness space and people who are trying to like rise up the ranks and lifting and whatnot and talk about we need better athletes or whatever in this country for lifting, man, you forget the kind of freak athletes that are playing fucking football in the United States. Yeah. I mean, some seriously strong, explosive yeah. guys and hitting each other in a fantastically impressive way. 870 squat. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he'd be top. Like, with that squat at a 242 weight class, which was what you compete in, in yeah. powerlifting, right now with the guys competing, you'd be oh, a, one of the class. top lifters. You are know? you Yeah, you'd be a top five lifter. I got to throw this, some I mean, I'm back. thinking that's what I'm doing with fucking like with Ed Cohen and those guys. With that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Dan yeah. Green and, uh, you know, uh, Chris Duffin and those guys are the set the new ones. That they're high eights, but you'd be Maurice, right up you there. Would, you wouldn't make a fucking penny doing that, maybe. It'd be cool as shit, dude. You made the right choice. <laughs> you'd get a $5 medal, and you'd always be proud of that shit. <laughs> After winning the meet, <laughs> now, uh, hooking up with Corey, I obviously fell in love with weightlifting, and uh, and, and sort of played to kind of jump into the story. Well, one thing with Corey, Corey was cool and introduced me to weightlifting, and uh, I got back into it. But uh, in regards to how that helped me in college, uh, I was just kind of stronger than everybody, and that thing happened. Uh, and AJ, to get back to your point, and so after we had completed the season, I ran out there and ran for a bunch of yards and got, and got the championship. Uh, when the off season that came, I basically accepted a bunch of illegal benefits, uh, and with that being said uh, the NCAA kicked me out of school and so when they kicked me out of school uh, for a year just my life kind of got turned upside down and so I didn't want to stay out of football and I said hey uh, I believe I'm good enough to play in the NFL uh, some of the people that had competed against I've seen these guys go in the first and second round in the draft prior to that and I said you know I said no offense to them but I can play this game you know what I'm saying I was big I was strong uh, at 18 you know you feel like you're running the world you know 18 yeah. 19 years old I felt like I uh, controlled the world uh, and so if you scrub that much I don't see why you wouldn't <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and just basically that's how it happened. And so I tried to um, enter the NFL after uh, my, my first year of college, my second year actually, and uh, they basically rejected me. And since I had declared to go to the NFL, uh, it made me ineligible to go back to college. You're in so, this middle ground, eh? So, so I was kind of like a, uh, like the, the man without a country. And so at that point I came back, I turned back to the streets. Uh, I never had a um, – uh, I never had a will to want to be do, do anything academically. You know, so when I was in school, I was taking officiating softball, officiating golf, and classes just to stay eligible, but nothing in regards to just basically be having a career this, of some sort. Right, you had, like, a passion vacuum at this point because all you want to do is prove it. I can fucking play this game. They took it away, or you find this dead space. So yeah. like you're left to kind of make bad decisions if, like, your passion's robbed from you you don't know what else to do. Was it just, like, too much time sitting around like, man, I got to fucking get back in it? Well, I guess it goes back to mentality coming up. Uh, I grew up in the inner city of Youngstown, so – you don't see a lot of people have success academically. They don't have professions. It's just drugs, crime, and that. You know what I'm saying? So the only way that you're taught to make it out is just either run a football, dribble a football, or be an entertainer. This is the only so thing. So to your awareness, this is, this is your option. If you don't have it, they're telling you basically you're taught that you don't have an option. Well, yeah, and the other thing, too, is as you'd have massive success, there, there becomes no doubt that this is your path. Like yes. I always say, there's no plan B. Plan B is plan A. Yes. Because when you're 100% in, you're 100% in. So you're not thinking like, oh, man, well, what's my fullback? Because the minute you think, what's my fullback? You're, you're basically yourself. declaring, I'm not going to be the best. Yeah. And yeah. You, you weren't just good. You were the best. And that thought process was, you know, this is my, this is going to be me. And everyone around you, no one around you was saying to you either, like, you better have a backup plan. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and that's probably. Well, everybody's probably, like, looking at the size of your wall, girl, looking to just push you as hard as possible as forward. Like, just fucking keep going. Push, push, push. Yeah, but, and this is the thing where actually I'll get a, a greater return for my investment. I invest myself. I lift weights. I do some conditioning drills. Uh, and I'm going to make millions of dollars. And just like with any other profession, uh, you start to see the guys ahead of you. You see the awards that they have. And you start to see the awards that I had. You know, since all the guys who went on to have all the success, I was basically following in that track. So me going to worry about my studies, it didn't mean anything at that point. You know what I'm saying? So uh, to get back into the story, when I when I when I played, when I got kicked out of school, uh, I had nothing. You know what I'm saying? Like depression and life kind of hit me. So uh, in regards to getting better on the football field, I can deal with that stress because I can lift more, I can study more film, I can learn how to uh, do a better stiff arm, or I can learn how to eat better so I can be quicker on my feet and things like that. But in regards to just being a young man 
in and dealing with life, I had no clue of how that worked. You know what I'm saying? Wow, yeah. uh, you're so, a kid. I mean, you're, you're fantastically physically gifted. Man, but at 18, you still you don't have you don't, all the experiences yet. No, you don't have the, the, the fluidity to just think and solve problems. And uh, just get, my cognitive skills weren't there. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, after that, I basically went right back to the streets. When I go back to the streets, I'm just doing what I know. I'm, I'm just the same behavior, but I'm very popular. My potential for my success in football is, is, is high. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but I'm not sort of seizing the moment. And uh, when I set out those two years, uh, just – my energy and, and my priorities had changed. You know, I'm out in California. Uh, I, every single day I'm waking up is Xanax, Percocets, Vicodins. Oh, man, uh, yeah. You know, just partying. You know what I'm saying? The, the, the whole California culture, smoke all day, party all day, party all night. I got involved in that. You know what I'm saying? So this happened for two years, and it was like, hey. It's uh, fine if you're an entrepreneur. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this guy's trying to be a fucking professional athlete. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> Mike's like, oh, that sounds pretty fucking good to me, Maurice. He's like, I'm in California. I'm not living that lifestyle. I don't know. He's like, man, I'm with the wrong people. I was, <laughs> I was on Sunset too much. Uh, <laughs> I was on Sunset entirely too much. But, you know, uh, two years have passed, and it's time for me to come back to the NFL. And uh, when, they, when we went through a workout, like, the, the day was approaching. You know, like, and you know, sometimes when you're not prepared, you can kind of feel it. So we go to the workouts, and uh, when it's time to run a 40, when it's time to jump a vertical jump I basically fell horribly in all these uh, activities uh, and so with that being said uh, they basically like hey uh, my, my dreams of being a professional athlete started to diminish uh, luckily two months later April had to come and uh, coach Shanahan was coaching for Denver at the time yeah uh, he called me up and he said hey Maurice you know we're going to take a chance on you and he's trying to like rekindle that fire I got out to Denver and when I'm out here uh, just my mind wasn't right you know so that I didn't have the mentality that hey I want to become a professional athlete in my mind I was a gangster on the streets you know saying so a gangster who played football at one point when I was trying to transition uh, to professional football like this. That's, that's a big fucking yeah. transition, man. Big, scary yeah. jump, right? Yeah, j- j- like this, uh, to go from the streets and the guy who's living a street life in a party to a guy who's transitioning and trying to be a professional athlete, it just doesn't mash up. Uh, so I get to Denver, and, you know, I'm, I'm not socializing with guys. I'm real, like, I'm, I'm an introvert. Uh, I don't want to be a good teammate. And uh, Denver tried to help me, you know, so they tried to put me down with a psychologist and like, hey, uh, you've had a few traumatic experiences happen. Can you have somebody to kind of help you out? And so me just, uh, just being naive and ignorant to the process, I was like, nah, there's nothing that this lady can help me out with. She doesn't understand where I'm coming from. Uh, so we're, con- we're continuing to go on through the preseason. It's like week four. We're playing the Indianapolis Colts. And uh, he called me in again. He said, hey, Maurice, uh, could you could you please sit down with this woman because she's trying to help you? Next thing I know, she um, – I tell uh, Coach Shanahan no, and that Monday he called me in his office. He said, hey, uh, we've tried to give you all the help that we could, uh, and you're resistant to it, so uh, we have to get rid of you. And that's when they got rid of me and basically just came right back to Ohio and right back to the streets. And how was that? How was your mindset then? I mean, this is is the low point or one of the low points. Yeah, you know, uh, anytime you're with the drugs and the depression and uh, even when you fail in life, even when you fail um, at something that you love. You know, I've never been told in my life that I wasn't good at football. Uh, And so the fact that I failed, it hurt my ego it hurt my pride it hurt everything that uh basically i i my, my whole image or my whole identity was based around football i think i got shattered this moment i got shattered right and sure. so inside of that uh coming back to ohio the, the, the way i felt about myself was pretty much the way i treated other people i hated life i hated everything going on and even when i was back here hustling it just didn't feel the same because i knew i didn't give everything that i was supposed to to the game uh so after that after two or three months of being back i catch a robbery case in downtown columbus uh this is new year's eve January 31st, transition to 06. Uh, another two weeks after that, my girlfriend, is, I found out she's pregnant. We're still together. We've been together 10 years. Uh, but find out uh, in the process that she's pregnant, that's uh, another amount of stress, stress oh, on me. Fuck yeah, dude. <laughs> fuck yeah. Uh, and then August, August, obviously, the big arrest came. And um, I was coming down to Columbus. It's about 3 in the morning. Uh, and I'm actually on, I was on the east side. And so I'm coming down, and I get off on the exit. But I've been drinking at this point, so I get off on the wrong exit. So I come down, I get off on the wrong exit, and this uh, pull up to the stoplight. I pull up to the stoplight, and I say, hey, well, I'm going to just make a U-turn. I'm drunk. I'm, just going, I'm, I'm going the wrong way. And as I make the U-turn, there's a police officer sitting inside of the um, a Home Depot parking lot. So I make the U-turn. He pulls out. And mind you, I have an AK-47 on the seat. Oh, shit, Maurice. <laughs> no. Oh, man. Uh, no, so, damn. No, yeah. yeah, so I, I pull over to the well, side of the road. Why'd you have what that? What? What do you? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> what do you say to the fucking cop when you pull over and like, um, 
Yeah, this, this is a, this is a gift for my friend. He's a no, gun collector. Yeah. <laughs> what, what the fuck did you say to him? No, Damn. No, so so the, the, this is the um, this is the moment. So I pull over and uh, he pulls behind me. And so I saw an episode on Cops once where the guy <laughs> got out the car, the police officer got out the car, he walked up on the car, and the guy kind of scooted off. Uh, so this was in my mind to kind of do this. So I pulled over. He gets out the car. He walks up on the car, and I pull off. And as I pull off, like, I'm not going too fast, and I'm not going too fast because I'm in a Hyundai. And the Hyundai's aren't the getaway car, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you're like, hmm, no options here, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, so I, jump, I jump on the freeway. I'm, I'm going and going and going. Uh, we'll probably get two miles down the road. Are you, are you familiar with Columbus? Yeah, we've been here a bunch. Okay, so you're familiar with Potaska? Yeah, that's where Old School Gym is, I think. The right? Old School Gym is there, right? So it's also a bunch of woods, right? You know, the, brother, uh, the brothers don't do the woods. <laughs> <laughs> well, I say it all the time. The brothers don't do the woods. The Caucasians don't do the hoods, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I make the U-turn. I'm coming back. And uh, as I'm coming back towards Columbus, uh, and I have it in my mind to get out of here and get away. Uh, there's a police officer sitting in the middle of the road. He throws the spike strips out. He hits the car. Uh, the, this the, is what, intense, man. Yeah, this, yeah I mean, Youngstown boys, if you I watch mean, this it. Was, yeah, this is national news. I remember yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. And the, I mean, Whoa. again, it was weird. Now the world was on you again, but for something completely different. Something. I, I just want to break before you carry on because I think what's interesting is that you, you were the very best, and then this happened. But in your experience, you probably see a lot of athletes. And I know it's probably part of what you do now and why you do what you do is because your, your experience, although maybe – new to some people listening to the show it's not a unique experience no like uh, you know i'm blessed to have met a lot of professional athletes because of who, who i was and, and the connections i have but i hear this story a lot you know and, and and the espn has done a lot of stuff uh shorts and stuff on on you know how broke pe how people go from you know having everything the world to nothing this yeah. is not an unusual thing it's, in it's the more united common states than the success yeah it's a very it's a very normal thing yeah. right and, and so at this point in time like did you have did you still have that, like, I know you had a chip on your shoulder, you were angry, but did you still have the kind of thought process, like, well, I'm Maurice Claret. Like, when, when, even when you were doing the escape, you, like, part of you was like, I'm going to get away with this because I'm Maurice Claret. Yeah, because um, when you're an athlete and you're, you're a dominant athlete, you tend to live outside of the normal rules. You know what I'm saying? People allow you to do what you want to do. Uh, and there's always somebody who saves you because you contribute to something. Uh, but what happened in this moment, I didn't have any more eligibility at Ohio State, or I didn't have any more eligibility. Well, I, I wasn't in the NFL, so it, it made it a bit harder. Uh, and even how, you, even when you said uh, th th this story is more common than the success story, uh, and, and, and fundamentally it's like that because so much is given to guys when they're young that the only way that you're going to make it in life is to become a professional athlete. Uh, this is the only way to secure yourself a future. And, uh, and that's the point that I argue all the time. I feel like um, when you get placed on these campuses, they should have a responsibility to educate you right, right? If we look around here, if you look all around here, there's no, um, let's say, football players in here, but there's a lot of successful businessmen, right? Yeah. You can build yourself a company. You can learn accounting, finance, and, and some of everything else, right? Uh, but what happens is that you, you you place these athletes on these campuses and you give them classes like officiating softball, officiating golf. Oh, and it takes this, the, yeah, the, the but, easy road. Yeah, but, time, but it yeah. does nothing for you long term, right? So uh, if the statistics show you that only 1% of these guys will go on, and out of that 1%, the average career will be four years, right? If I'm going to spend my time on this college campus, right, and I'm going to give my body and I'm going to generate all this revenue, I should be getting compensated equally uh, in regards to education, and, and, and I believe athletes should be paid. And so that's that's where the gap is. You know, that's yeah. when I go around. I talk to athletic directors. I talk to coaches. I ask this, right? Uh, you're the head coach of a university, right? Uh, would you allow your child to, to take those same courses that you allow your star quarterback to take? No. And you know the consequences. He's like, no, I need you to have skills in case this doesn't work out. In case this no. doesn't work out. so Because it probably won't. If, 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 if this guy's helping you secure your job, he's helping you to make millions, why would you set him up for failure, so to say? Yeah. You, know, well, you know, it's, it's interesting with that, too, because the, the, they are such role models to you. But beyond that, athletes as individuals have a set of skills that are transferable absolutely the passion the dedication all of the stuff you did like you said everything was training you you failed on the field it was okay back to the drawing what do i need to do what do we need athletes don't have that like fail and like now now i'm done right it's right. it's not a failure it's a lesson every absolutely. game is a lesson that skill is that's the same skill you need in business that's the same skill you need in life right you, absolutely. you have an argument with your girlfriend like you don't just walk out. It's like okay, I gotta we figure out a girlfriend anymore if you do that. But but like you said, they don't show you that it's transferable. They they set you up. It's literally this is all I know how to do, and then you're left on your own. Let's get back to the story. 
because th that point was, would you say that was a life-saving moment? As dark as it was, as bad as it was, was that really the turning point for you? Yeah, uh, for, for me, it was a life-saving moment because it forced me to stop everything that I was doing. Uh, up until that point, I never gave myself time to just discover myself. Uh, so the fact that I got caught with all the guns and I had a case pending, I knew I wasn't going anywhere. Well, hang on a second. So the cop threw the spikes out. Yeah, so we, I mean, we left that part of the story. I feel like, I feel like there's like this big, this big, everyone's like, well, what happened? And he's like, oh, that's what I'm thinking the whole uh, time. No, well, he, he, throws, he throws the spike strips out. Um, tires blow up, and I'm riding down the freeway, and at this moment, I get on the phone with my mother. Uh, and it shows it in the hey, film. Hey, Mom, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> how are you doing? How was church and all? Yeah, it, it just really, I just said, Mom, I feel like getting out the car and having a shootout with him. You know what I'm saying? It was like, it was me. Um, oh. Like, I just, and, and it shows it in the film. And uh, and she starts crying when she talks about it because I was like, Holy hey. Holy shit, imagine um, this conversation. Wow, yeah. man. And it just really just like, but you know, like uh, everybody, I'm pretty sure everybody up here has been depressed at some point. You yeah. know what I'm saying? You feel yeah, like you hit rock bottom. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, or anything. You just kind of hit rock bottom. You yeah. know what I'm saying? I felt like this moment was my rock bottom but uh, I wanted to have a shootout because I knew they'd kill me right you know what I'm saying like, right. it, there was, it wasn't me intention I was just like it wasn't okay, like you thought you were going to get away with no. it it was your way out I'm, I'm about right. to kill myself I didn't have yeah. the courage to kill myself but I'm about to get killed from doing this right, right. Um, and Damn. you know and whatever she said to me I'm not sure what she said to me at that moment I pull over uh, they put a taser on me and throw me in the back of the paddy wagon. At that moment, that's kind of where uh, everything has stopped. Uh, and so I get to the county jail, uh, and, and based upon my status, I'm, I'm locked in isolation, right? And so uh, this, this is the worst environment a human can be in, right? Yeah, I mean, just putting anybody in the cage and just shutting the door and saying, hey, here, here, here's a metal slab and here's a toilet. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's your reality for 23 hours of the day. There's, uh, there's no input. There's no hardly any light. No, no there, there's no light. There's no light. Um, there's no light. There's a toilet. You get two pair of drawers. Uh, you get two T-shirts and you get three meals. The first one's at four. The second one's at ten. And the last one's at three or four. And this is pretty much this is your life right now. You know what I'm saying? And, Fuck, uh, man. How uh, long did they keep you in there? Uh, the, the the initial process was seven months, 23 hours out the day. Fuck, so, Maurice. Yeah. How'd you do? It? Jesus. Bro, I, I tell you like this. You'll you'll find out a lot about yourself. Uh, just, just sitting still. Like if, if, if it was us four just sitting still right here uh, over the course of seven months, you'll just start to dis like you just start to think about what you're thinking oh, about. You know what I'm saying? Seven well, we were talking. His yeah. wife's gonna do uh, a meditation retreat. We're talking about how she people don't realize the, uh, how difficult it is to sit in silence. Oh yeah. So but, ten day vipassana retreat. It's ten days of complete silence. Complete um, silence. No wow. eye contact. Um, and you sit for six to ten hours a day. Like sit and meditate. I mm. think there's a little bit of instruction, but there's no interaction. So, but that, imagine doing if you that wanted, if you want, around you. I, I mean, obviously, what you experienced was more intense than that. But if you wanted a, a taste of what kind of well, what you're talking about, it's the same intent. Most people I can't think. even meditate for 30 minutes. You, you know, like, like <laughs> right, right. five <laughs> minutes, dude. Well, five minutes, well, I can't do and it. And if you don't believe in meditation, like most people don't sit and pray it like once a right. day. Like they right. find it hard to even focus on prayer, you know? So it's like, no matter what, what it is, like just sitting still with your thoughts is like one of the most powerful things, but it is yes. the hardest thing. Yeah, you were forced yeah. into that. Some people, it breaks them. You know, yeah, they absolutely. say like people lose their mind in jail. For you, I it, say most people. it was a good, good experience. But, but I right? I, I've seen more people, uh, and I never see, I, I never could identify, when they say people go crazy, prison I've seen guys actually transition from normal and like this to just crazy because uh, the dynamics of the environment or the intense amount of everything, everything in, like, everything in prison is like your biggest weightlifting competition every day. You know what I'm saying? Whether you like it or not, whether it's you want to be on or not. Yeah, it's everybody, like, so you have to imagine, um, the prison that I was in, 85% of the guys are doing more than 20 years. And so uh, you, you have a mixture of, like, you have the mixture of guys who've been in the 70s, the early 80s, uh, all the way to the new guys coming in, which are myself. And you just have uh, all type of cities. Um, it, it, it's, it's just nuts. Did you, know? you think what, what, at that point that you were going to be in there for 20? Was, was, was that had, running through your head? No, like? I, I had seven and a half years, but the uh, I, I got out in four. I had seven and a half years at first. Uh, but... You're, you're like you can't even think that far. You know what I'm saying? I didn't even think that far. It was like, survival every day. Yeah, but I, I got more interested into the programming because uh, one thing prison does do, uh, they offer up programs if you're into them. You know what I'm saying? So the first, my first day in prison, the warden came to me and he said, man, I want to help you to try to succeed through this moment. And I'm going to set up these uh, classes for you to kind of go through and, and kind of do your deal. You know what I'm saying? So I went through about uh, 13 months worth of coursework and also I got connected with the guy who was in there. He was a Navy SEAL. And I think that was kind of the best thing initially that happened to me. So uh, I went to prison 
prison and just from the drinking and drugging, I was 275. So I got with him, and his workouts were so intense. You know, once you start working out again, you get your confidence back, your mentality's rolling. But this was the first time I actually picked up books. Like, the, I never read prior to prison, and I wow. started falling in love with books. And so they used to have his catalog. Uh, it was called Bargain Books. And so uh, you were able to uh, order books for 2 and $3. You know so you could order high-end books, and it was like a, a discount bookstore. Uh, so people would send me money, and I just order huge amounts of books, 20 books at a time, 25 books. Wow. Right and they'll, on, they'll sell these uh these different these notepads uh in prison. And so I would just take so this it. Is, kind of, this is after your seven months in yeah. solitude. Yeah, so this, this, this is this, this so, is once I'm so, in prison. So you did you did seven months in solitude yes. essentially prior, prior to prison. That's prior to prison. Yes. So basically that was during like the sentencing process. Uh no, they they sentence me and then you basically go to a reception facility. And you, you go from the county jail to a reception facility and then they determine where you go throughout the state. And so, you know, they have 52 prisons, and you have to basically go in one of them. Yeah. So during that seven months, what did that – what do you feel like that solitude, solitude did to you? Do you, uh, do you feel like maybe you it, got to know yourself? Yeah, I, I, I call it like the meditative state. Um, you, you sit in silence because you and your celly don't talk. You know, so you and your guy, you, you have nothing to talk about because – it's like two different people from two different environments getting placed in a, in a, in a cell. And um, just from the amount of mail I had in and just from me initially starting to read, uh, I was just figuring out how did I come here. You know, I'm like, uh, there's nothing important. There's no car that's important. There's nothing, there's no thing that's important. The only thing that's important is like, how did I come here? You know what I'm saying? What did I do and how did, how did my thinking on a daily basis bring me here? And so that was like the origination or the, the, the starting point to kind of uh, me going in prison. So when I went yeah. to prison, I had... Um, some sense of self. I didn't have the confidence because I wasn't in shape and I was like sitting like, you know, you sit down for seven months without exercise. You're like, oh, yeah. you're blowing up. Yeah. You know, I'm eating uh, crackers and little Debbie's and stuff like that. You know, like yeah, junk yeah, yeah. food. Nothing, <laughs> yeah. nothing good. Yeah, nothing good. Um, and, this, and, this, and essentially all that stuff kind of pushed on to prison. And um, once I got there, man, I'm just telling you, like, it, it sounds so cliche, but education, you know, said so just yeah. self-education. Well, it's funny. We just, we, we interviewed Corey, who stood here, uh, you know, for the Barbell Shrug and Barbell business. But he was talking about reading too and I, and I emphasize the point that the most successful people in the they read almost every day yeah and so even in the worst environment you picked up one of this the basic skills to success good you know and, and you had that foundation and, and the fact you fell in love with reading i had kind of a not not similar experience but i didn't read a book until college and then uh, i didn't really you know, either, i got man. into I, yeah, I, got, I got into business and that's when i i, I actually could read a book yeah so I, I couldn't I, I, half the stuff they were trying to teach in college i, I never even paid attention to <laughs> Uh, somehow I make it made it through college, but but when I got when I got into a subject I loved, I found I'm obsessive and I'm exploratory. So if, if the book recommends another book, I take note. I go order those books. books you know, I have another ten. I read one book. I have another ten. I gotta read. Yeah. Was, but but that's it, it's a it's cool to see that that was kind of the same experience, even though in the environment was completely different. But at that moment, it's like, because uh, you become curious, you get to understand better, you get to communicate better, uh, you can appreciate more. And just my life, the um, the appreciation for words and everything, you know what I'm saying? Just even like, this is like, uh, just even with a podcast, the purest form of communication. You know, you're just communicating with people and expressing feelings and all that. And so I enjoyed that part of it, you know what I'm saying? So uh, when I was in prison, it didn't seem so, it, it didn't seem like a big punishment. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it looked more like a, as a time to develop myself. And you found know gratitude yeah. even in the worst of situations. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, but, you know, reading a bunch of philosophy, psychology, and also I think another thing that helped, uh, I was reading business, you know, and so uh, like my whole mind was like, okay, uh, I can't play football anymore. What am I going to do with myself? You know what I'm saying? So I started reading everything I could about Warren Buffett and value investing Damn, yeah. and financing. Yeah, everything. I'll tell you a cool story in a minute, right? Uh, <laughs> and so essentially all this, all these things um, basically just, just helped to form and develop my mind. And uh, after three, like after three years and 11 months, right, after me gaining the respect from all the inmates and people knowing me and like, hey, Reese is just going to work out. He's going to come to the gym. He's going to play basketball. He's going to mind his business. But I started to have a group of young guys, you know, and the young guys would come in and they'd be like, damn, how the hell did you get to where you're at now? Like, why doesn't this bother you as much as it does him or him or somebody else? And so one of the coolest things in there was like I was just able to give young guys books, you know what I'm saying? Because a lot of this stuff comes down oh, to, wow. Righteous, uh, man. yeah, you know, a lot of them don't have father figures. You know what I'm saying? A lot of young guys in inner city, they just don't have father figures and, and they want to do right, but they just don't have the guidance. You know what I'm saying? Right. They, just, they don't know, man. They just don't know. Yeah. And so I was the, like, 
in a, in a way, it, the, the, the initial approach, uh, it was hard for me to get to them uh, because they don't know how to go ask for help. You know what I'm saying? The help is not considered strong. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so even, even in regards to that, you know, I, I had a chance to do that. And after four years, uh, I eventually was let out of prison. Uh, but when I was in there, I, I completed some coursework from Ohio University. And uh, when, I, when I initially got out, I wanted to get into senior care services. Uh, and I wanted to get into adult daycare, adult, uh, excuse me, adult daycares, adult transportation, in-home care. And I, I wanted to attack the whole baby boom generation, have me a whole plan behind it. Uh, Let's but, take a break real quick. And then we'll talk about how you uh, made that transition out of prison. Let's take half. a break real quick. Yeah. Go, yeah. guys, Mike Bledsoe here from the Barbell Shrug Podcast here to do a technique wad on the snatch. The snatch is my favorite movement of all time. Not just because of the name, but because it is a full body movement. It's very athletic. Uh, it takes a lot of precision, finesse. Uh, it is probably the hardest thing that you could master in the world of fitness. Uh, if you don't know what a snatch is, Alex... My assistant here will show you exactly what a snatch looks like. Give us a snatch, Alex. So some of you may be thinking, well that was easy, he just grabbed a bar and he threw it over his head, and it was, looked silly. But a lot of you, if you're familiar with CrossFit or the sport of weightlifting, uh, are very familiar with that and understand how difficult it can be. So we're gonna go over the, the movement, break it down just a little bit. I'm gonna start with the starting position. So this is not a deadlift. Uh, a lot of people make uh, the common mistake that they should set up like a deadlift and they bring their shins right up to the bar. That is definitely what you should not do. So for most people, that's gonna be, the bar's gonna start over the ball of their foot, all right? So a little bit forward of midfoot just as Alex is set up here. It's gonna be a little bit different for everybody. As you get more into practice, you'll find exactly which position works best for you. It's gonna depend, it's gonna vary from person to person, little by little. All right, so <clears throat> he's gonna start standing there. He's now gonna reach down. He's gonna actually push his knees forward and let his shins come to the bar, all right? So again, not like a deadlift. If, if you're doing a deadlift, your hips would be higher. So Alex has his hips lower here. Notice that he has his shoulders in front of the bar here. So if I'm looking at this arm, it's almost straight up and down. What he doesn't want to do is sit back towards, he doesn't want to sit back anymore. You don't want to look like that. You want to bring your shoulders in front of the bar. This back is going to stay nice and tight here. And then he's also going to be engaging his lats a little bit right here. So as he comes up, he's going to be using his shoulders to keep that bar close to his body. So we're going to do the first half of the snatch. So Alex is going to lift this bar up and bring it up to his hips. And so as he's here, again, even right here at the hips, his shoulders are slightly in front of the bar. His weight is towards his heels here. So if 
if you were to think about where your weight should be, it's at the front of your heels here. All right, let's go back to the floor. So that's what it's gonna look like. You're gonna squeeze the bar off the floor. You don't wanna yank it off the floor, which is another common mistake. So he's gonna squeeze it off the floor. He's gonna get above the knees. He's gonna touch the bar to his hips. And then he's gonna jump and pull himself underneath the bar. So he's gonna let that bar, he's gonna squeeze that bar off the ground. As it comes up, he's gonna explode and jump up. That bar's gonna meet him at his hips. And it's gonna get over his head. The biggest problem most people have is keeping that bar close and the bar meeting their hips, all right? Once you've got that, now you really need to focus on pulling underneath the bar. A real common mistake is that there's a lot of hips. <laughs> no, we have to edit that out. <laughs> uh, one of the things that people do is they, they find they can really meet the bar really well with their hips and they find they're, they're snapping that and then they're really lazy about getting underneath. And so what you really wanna do is make sure that after you master that, that hip extension and really firing that bar up off of your hips, that you then remember to involve your arms just as much as you did with your hips. So this is much of an emphasis on pulling underneath as it is with pulling up. So think about pulling up with your hips and underneath, underneath with your arms and shoulders. It's one continuous pull. All right, so remember that and watch Alex. He keeps the bar nice and close as it go, goes past his chest, past his face, and overhead. Hopefully this is going to help you move forward in your adventures and <laughs> it's an adventure. It's an adventure. <laughs> uh, in your snatch adventures. Uh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I can't even think now. For more information about how to do how to perfect your snatch, damn it. All right, for more information on the snatch, go to barbellshrug.com. We've got more technique videos. Uh, technique wad videos, breaking down the snatch, <laughs> the, the smaller components <laughs> of the lifts. There you go. Uh, what Mike's trying to say is that this is a kind of a general overview, and we have other videos on technique wad where we break down the movement into, into its component parts. We go over like the first pole, the second pole, the transition, the catch phase, et cetera, et cetera. So if, if you're more advanced and you want to have more details on each specific part of the lift and you want mobility drills or other weightlifting drills, I feel like I'm just like really close to you right now. Uh, and you have more weight, you... <laughs> you got to talk into the microphone. Uh, I, I, felt, I felt weird. I was like, I was like right here on all you. Right, all right, if you want any more information on all that other stuff, go to barbellstruck.com. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm talking real loud into the microphone. All right. Three, two, one. <laughs> and we're back with Maurice Claret. Maurice, you were just telling us, uh, so you got out of prison and you were... You had this plan for your transition for, a lot of information. for senior care. I mean, you had, you had educated yourself, you had read books, you had helped out younger guys that were there, you'd been giving them books and kind of served as a role model. Uh, you got out kind of early, I guess? Yes, uh, I got out in four years. And uh, go ahead. And, and, and you, you had this plan to, to go after, uh, go after uh, senior ser services, like yes. uh, take on the uh, baby boomer. I mean, it's obvious the baby boomers need help yes. at this point. Um, all of them aren't doing you know, physically well. Yeah, so, but it, yeah. yeah, the whole industry is uh, was wide, it, it still is wide open for uh, services. And um, so I got out. I went back to Ohio State and had the whole mission of complete my degree. But I, when I was out there, uh, Coach Trussell, who was the, the coach at the time, he uh, got in touch with me and he said, hey, Maurice, there's a team in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, who wants to uh, eventually have you try out. So I said, okay, uh, are they paying? You know what I'm saying? I didn't want to go out there and pay for free because I was broke when I got out of prison. Uh, the next thing you know, I uh, go out there, I try out, and I eventually uh, get on the football team. So I'm out here for a year. We have a uh, moderate success. It was like a 4-4 four and four season. Uh, but I was like, this is not my only thing. I'm cool on this. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't have any interest in football anymore. I don't want to get banged on. I'm cool with that. Yeah. Uh, so I, I was like, okay, how do I implement the plan of giving me some money? So um, in football, uh, the thing that everybody knew about me is that I wasn't fast. Uh, but I, I had brute strength, but I was very intelligent, right? I can understand the game like the back of my hand. I understood concepts, formations. I understood tendencies. I understood how to teach it. Uh, and this was my way to basically get back into it. Um, excuse me. You have a lot of guys who treat strength and conditioning and speed, but there wasn't anything uh, to teach. Or, or there's, there's a lot of things that you can get uh, in regards to teaching the actual game, right? So yeah. I went over to a youth league practice. And... Um, 
excuse me, to separate myself from people. I said, hey, uh, can I come and give you a coach as a coaching clinic? I watched you all for two or three days, uh, and I think there's just some ways I can help you out to be able to coach better. So I gave them a coaching clinic for free. I had about seven or eight guys show up, and I go through the board, and basically I hooked them in, right? I showed them everything I know. I show them how different different ways to approach kids and teaching and coaching and all that stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, so they bought into it. I said, hey, we can come and do this thing every Saturday. Just give me 20 bucks, and we'll go from there. Uh, so the coaching grew from like seven guys to maybe 20. After that, uh, I, I went and basically attacked the kids. So I got the first camp we had. It was me and a guy, me and a guy by the name of Matt Overton. Uh, we had about 25 kids initially. 25 kids grew to 50. 50 grew to 75. Awesome. Uh, Matt eventually left from um, Matt left from um, Omaha. He went to the Indianapolis Colts. Got picked up by the team. Uh, and after that, uh, the last thing we had about like 370 kids. Right. So we were running yeah, a full fledged awesome. business. Wow. Uh, and this was all within like 18 months of me being released from prison. Uh, I was over there coaching, helping out. But basically, I was able to build a business uh, with football and teaching football and the, the aspects of the actual game. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, and, and I felt like that's how I separated myself. Uh, so I was doing relatively well doing that. Excuse me, another cool story I was going to tell you about Omaha. So Omaha is uh, the place of Warren Buffett. Uh, and the cool story is that our head coach, uh, you got to keep up with me on this one, our head coach um, was the ex-CEO of TD Ameritrade. Uh, his name is Joe Mowgli. Uh, so Joe Mowgli made about $300 million. He left uh, Ameritrade. He's wow. still the chairman of the board. Uh, but he said he wanted to get back into something he loved, which was football. Yeah. So he got back into football, and so uh, we would sit down and we would just talk. And he said, "Hey, Maurice, one day he was like, uh, just come, come to the golf course with me." He's like, "I want to hear a story. I want, I want to hear the story about your life." Uh, so we sit down, we talk, and we got and going through everything. Excuse me, and he, uh, I was I was telling about my fascination with Warren Buffett and finances and the whole business world. He was like, you know what, uh, Warren Buffett and uh, Bill Gates are my good friends. He was like, uh, yeah, it's all right. So yeah, that's wild yeah. friends I have, man. <laughs> this, this is a, a rapid change of circumstance, man. Uh, yeah, so uh, so next thing I know, I'm like, okay, cool. Uh, Warren Buffett's your buddy, and I'm like, he's not going to meet me. You know, I, I knew from then, you know, it cost six hundred thousand a meeting, uh, or six hundred. People pay six hundred thousand an hour to uh, first right. time. Right. Next thing I know, we um um. I'm walking high rate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, can we afford that for his advice, Mike? How many, yeah, how many e-books right. we got to sell right now? <laughs> yeah, no, we'll work on it. Uh, so he, he hits me up. Uh, this is a Wednesday. I'm walking through the hall. I'm walking through my apartment. He hit me up, and uh, I heard him on so many interviews, and he was like, hey, Maurice. And I'm like, oh, I started looking at my girlfriend. I'm like, this is Warren Buffett. You know, I'm jumping up and down like a kid. Uh, and he was like, uh, hey, he was like, uh, uh, Joe told me you wanted to meet me. He was like, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm at my office Friday, Saturday. He said, do you have anything going on? And, I, he like, <laughs> and I'm saying to him, I'm like, I'm over. Let me, let me, hang on, I got to put my schedule out. Let me check. I'm, I know I'm busy, but I might be able to squeeze it in while I'm <laughs> So I said, everything's canceled. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, so it was a cool moment. I had a chance to bring my family. We went down. Oh, wow. um, and after we go down, I sat with him for five hours. Just five wow. hours, one-on-one, wow. on one, yeah. That's and uh, The value of that discussion. Yeah, that $3 million yeah. conversation. Yeah, $3 million for, conversation yeah. free yeah. <laughs> on Damn. the house. But the cool thing about it was, like you said with the reading, all successful people, uh, he said the, the biggest thing is that he read four hours a day. And so he said, uh, he said, I think that's the only thing that separates me from people because I keep on developing my mind. Uh, and he said, I write notes all day. I read every day. And he said, if I want to invest in a business, I'll understand your business more than you. Uh, another good thing, he said he, uh, he said he only accepts seven phone calls a day. And he said, because people are a distraction. He said, if your life uh, doesn't naturally uh, intersect with others, uh, then you, you really don't have business talking to other people. Not in, a, not in a bad way, but he said you should be that committed to your process of becoming yeah. who you are. Yeah. And, uh, and so it was like it was cool to have those takeaways. So basically, after two and a half years, uh, the, the league I was playing it had shut down. Um, and due to my probation, I was only in Omaha to play football. So they said, hey, you have to go back. I don't care about your business. You have to go back to Ohio. So I was like, all right, cool, no problem. Uh, but I had a successful model that I was basically going to bring back to Ohio. And I said, okay, if I can teach football in Omaha, everybody knows me in Ohio. For football, I can do the same thing. Uh, so I came back here, and in the process of that, ESPN had reached out to me. And I'm not sure how they knew what was going on in my life, but they knew everything, right? Uh, so they said, hey. ESPN knows all. Yeah, they, 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 <laughs> ESPN and Google. <laughs> they know everything. Yeah. And basically, they reached out to me. They said, uh, hey, can we do a story upon your life? Uh, and I said, you know, who are, who are the directors? And, you know, they, what's the storyline? You know, and uh, they wanted to talk about football initially. And I said, you know, I don't have any interest in talking about football. I got, I got an interest in talking about decisions and choices and, and the consequences and, and more life uh, type of deals than anything. Yeah. Uh, so the next thing I know, we hooked up. And eight months throughout that process, uh, we were just filming everywhere. Uh, but I had a lady which, which started me speaking. I had a lady even, um, in, at, from Quinnipiac, 
it was in Connecticut. She reached out to me. She was the head law professor and had been doing a study on my life. Uh, so she said, hey, can you come out here? Can you talk about your life to a, a seminar that we have? I go out there. I talk. And, uh, and after I get done, you know, um, it was cool. One, she gave me a check, and I was like, "Cool, you can pay for talking." <laughs> <laughs> that, that is a better way to make a living. I like it. I like it. I like it. Uh, but after that, you know, she just was like, "You know, uh, your story can help so many young guys, uh, or just people in general." She said, uh, "Continue to tell your story." She said, "It's rough now, but the more you tell it, the more you understand it. The more you understand it, the more you be able to help people." You know what I'm saying? Oh, wow, yeah. And uh, and like when she said it, it didn't make sense. But I remember like just years down the road that you know she actually said that to me. Uh, so next thing I know. Um, one, 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 one moment or one engagement led to over 80 last year. You know, I was in 80 different cities, uh, being with universities, amazing, man. Uh, awesome. nonprofit things, just, just some of everywhere. I've seen everywhere around the country uh, and probably have about 60 on the road now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But it's obviously, able, it's been able to give me money and uh, get a few rental properties. Uh, next week, I'll buy a semi and get to the trucking game. Just a full-fledged entrepreneur. Uh, yeah. And also, yeah. yeah and also <laughs> that's pretty the, fucking awesome, dude. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's really cool. Yeah, but it, also in the, in the packaging world, too. So I hooked up with a guy in Oklahoma and uh, um, just in the packaging world. You, know, you and Corey have a podcast, right? Yeah, yeah. So that, that's the fun part. So Corey, uh, when I actually came into Ohio, me and Corey got together. Uh, we had met 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, but when I came back, it was Muscle Farm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it, yeah. It went from guy from local gym owner to... He got to, busy. Yeah, he got, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that guy got busy, yeah, man. He got busy. And, uh, and, and Corey just kind of blew up. And uh, next thing I know, uh, the common denominator was that I enjoy getting up early and I enjoy working out. So I started going over to old school gym in the morning. And uh, like he just like, you know, just like the grimy feeling. You know, it felt like a prison. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So like old school gym has the prison feel, the same feel that you get when you're incarcerated. So I uh, fell in love with the weightlifting and training. And then uh, he loved to read as well. Uh, so we began to convert, co- conversate back and forth. And then it was like, okay, how can we kind of wrap this information up and give it to people? Because social media is so big and you send out a couple of minutes to a tweet. Uh, but you really just try to spread your mentality. You know, so whenever you see somebody going through something, you can identify with it, just where they may yeah. be at or if they need some sort yeah. of help. And, and that's how the whole podcast me and Corey came. But I, I enjoy it. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. That's an amazing yeah. story. Yeah. It, it's it's, it's mind-blowing. Is that most of that story captured this uh and this is the ESPN produced documentary, Youngstown Boys. Yeah, that, I mean, dedicated I mean, under fire. Boom. Yeah. Boys, what's your? You, you've learned a, a staggering, amazing amount of lessons. You, you've turned things around in an extraordinary way. But, here, but here's the thing: there's people, they're maybe not exactly in your situation, but they're young athletes struggling to find their true passion. Their sport could be it. Some are more talented than others. What's your best advice for young developing athletes who? Who may not have the vision, maybe they don't quite believe, maybe they don't know where to start, they're hungry to do something. What's the best guidance you could offer them having learned all these damn lessons? It's awesome. Uh, well, in that case, it's, it's a good question. Um, each individual has to define what success is to them. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so many times we push on young athletes that football is the only way. Uh, but I make an illustration all the time. If you head to any of these suburbs around Columbus, you won't find an athlete in them. You'll find guys who have built lives. You'll find guys who are small business owners or skilled professionals. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and a lot of time in football, that's not pushed. It's not expressed. You know what I'm saying? So there's a thousand ways to get to where you want to get. But just like AJ said, you can take the skill set or the mentality of an athlete and apply that elsewhere. You know what I'm saying? So I try to, I, I try to push more guys away from football than I do to say, hey, you can make it. Because statistics don't prove it. Like, I couldn't get up on the stage right now and bench a thousand pounds because I've not prepared myself. You know what I'm saying? Uh, there's a lot of athletes in that same fashion who haven't prepared themselves for the lives they want to live, uh, yet and still they're just shuffled through the system. So it's just just finding out, defining what success is to you. This is what success is. This is how I want my life to be. And just finding multiple paths to get there. You know what I'm saying? If they, if like, okay, if, if me and you decided to have a crap game right here, right? And I told you, if we roll, you have a 1% chance of making it. You have a 1% chance of hitting your point, right? You wouldn't wage your whole future on it. You no. would, you, would, you You wouldn't wage everything. But in athletes, we do that. We wage everything that we have, everything we work for, we wage it on a 1% chance. You know what I'm saying? And so I actually push to find what success is uh, and just explore it. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, I, I have an athlete, okay, so excuse me, I've heard his name before, and I just heard it through passing and just probably just being associated with West Side and Louis and all that, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> here, here we, yeah, but here we go. So he has social capital, right? Yeah. So he, he can go meet any and everybody in here, and if he has some something to say or if he has some service, 
they're going to hook right on to it, and yeah. they're going to like the association. So for athletes, right, these guys are in everybody's communities, right? Uh, the fact that a guy played at Ohio State, or Notre Dame, or Michigan, he can use that social capital to basically leverage himself with some sort of business. You know what I'm saying? And so I try to push that and try to, like, explore, like, there's a lot of money in here. There's a lot of money in a lot of industries. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, a lot of opportunities. Yeah, uh, endless opportunities. Yeah, endless. Wherever you can look, you can find it. Well, here we go. Go, oh, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. So I was saying, uh, universities, I always explain this, right? Universities run off of donations, right? In order for you to have these donations, you need people who have money. So if I can get directly next to you and say, hey, can I just come intern for you? Can I get next to you and find out how you do what you do? Yep. And, and let's see if this may be of some interest to me. So I try to push that to young guys. Like, you know, don't chase the dream of being a football player. It's cool. Uh, and, and if you don't make it, it's not the end of the world. You yeah. know what I'm saying? There's a thousand ways to get to where you want to go. You know what I love about your story, too, is you, when you started this, this business venture with activities to help kids and help coaches, your focus was I have a lot of experience and I've gone through a lot of tough things. I have a clear vision for how I could just help people. Yeah. They didn't charge up front. You didn't have a grand vision other than I can help them when I want to. I'm going to start helping whoever will listen and then give everything I have. And then it grew all its own because what's, the initial drive was there. The honesty, you, you used what's wanted funny, to help. And most of our listeners probably didn't pick up, but you hustle from the streets. Give yeah. me twenty dollars and I'll be here on Saturday. <laughs> that, that's a straight street hustle. Give me twenty dollars, yeah. same exchange. That's all like, I need, but you man. change, you change the it's conversation. Ser- it's and service. Yeah. So, uh, what would I won't say the top book because everyone asks me that. I hate that because I always have a few. But uh, what would be what would be the top books you would recommend for a couple um, of people who who maybe maybe not read reading books? I've also heard <laughs> people ask to make it easy. Is like, what's the book you gift most? Oh, you gift to people because that. Uh, well, I, I don't gift it, but I recommend it on Twitter. Uh, I think the first one that sparked my mind was James Allen, As a Man Thinketh. Uh, have you ever heard of Dr. David Hawking? Mm-hmm. So Dr. David Hawking, Power Versus Force, Transcending Levels of Consciousness. He has about uh, 20 books, right? Yeah. He has a whole series, yeah. uh, and his series of books are the most impactful thing I've ever read. Yeah. Just Transcending oh, Levels wow. of Consciousness, uh, the things you associate with, the conversations that you have. Um, it's actually uh, back on, on, on uh, Amazon. I ordered about four months ago. And it's not kind. I got all the other ones, but that one is still. I'm like, that's yes. the one I went to order. Yeah, it's, it's iBooks. Uh, well, I guess I could. Download that thing. Man. I like the physical <laughs> books, <laughs> man. So I hate you. So if you can't find it, get it at least. No, I, I tell you, like, it has. I, look, I have a pad downstairs. I can't read books on. Uh, the iPad is hard for me. I like the physical. Yeah. I like the highlight. I'm like an old school reader. Yeah, I, yeah. I just like I don't know. I'm like a, I'm like a nerd in that aspect. But those are a few. Um, uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon yep. Hill. Uh, like I'm, I'm a personal development guy. Like the, the whole, just even the whole hook in business and anything is right. Let me let me let me give so much to you and let me offer you so much service that you need me. And uh, based upon my skill set, I'm going to be compensated for it. You know what I'm saying? And like and, and that's like I said, if you don't have a competitive advantage, don't compete. And so when it comes to training, everybody. Everybody can uh, can train guys from a physical standpoint, but my, my my intellectual property from knowing the game that's where that's where I was servicing these guys at, and I just found a way to package it. You know There's what I'm saying? One yeah. person with your skill set on this yeah. whole fucking planet. It's, it's you. Yeah, absolutely. Only one person can do this job you're doing now. But, but like this, a lot of guys don't understand themselves. You know, there's a lot of guys who are super successful but who just have no clue of who they are. You know what I'm saying? And so in that in that sense, you can't uh, duplicate it. You know what I'm saying? Like uh, a lot of these guys are made up from a bunch of coaches. You know what I'm saying? He plugs into me. He plugs into me. He plugs into me. And then I become something, but I don't understand who I am, right? Yeah. The only difference is I've understood who I was, the isolation, that process, and reading. And, and, and like I'm a big biography guy. Just reading other people's stories allow you to, like, understand your store you know like that's that oh, yeah like that's yeah, the only thing like well i thought i was the only guy alive yeah. struggling with this shit turns say, out everybody's struggling yeah, with this yeah, shit i say that all the time you think you're on your own little island and you get around other people and that's uh, me and mike connected that way yeah we're at a conference we start talking and it's like we're like the same person your story is so different yet the big takeaways i feel like it's like the same, same journey thing. different experiences different wor- worlds but the, the, the lessons are very similar, and, and I and agree with you. The concepts are the same. You yeah. read biographies, and you're like, man, I, I, I'm not the only one who thinks so weird. Like, I'm not the one. Like, because you're like, well, maybe everyone else is right, and I'm just weird over here. Right? It's, it, you know, it goes through that head. You're like, why do I think like this? And even, like, go back all the way when you're in high school, in college, and then even now. Like, obviously, now you surround yourself with like-minded people like yes. Corey and a bunch of other people. But back then, you probably – you felt like you were on your own island, and a lot of that's yeah. why it, it, things happened the way they did because 
you know, no one got you. But you, my you know, and now you understood yourself. It was a lot easier. And now it's obviously, it's a whole, it's always a process. We're always growing and learning. But uh, you don't have that when you're young, you know. No, I, but I even say this, uh, even going through the process of just educating yourself. You know, just like uh, when I went through the process of educating myself and becoming more confident to conversate. You know what I'm saying? Like when you're not educated, you don't want to talk to people. Uh, right. You don't want to ask for help. But, you know, just, just being more vulnerable, being a human being. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but that's, that's basically how I've been able to grow myself and grow everything I've been doing. Uh, when, I, when I went to speak, I never advertised. You know, I never advertised for anything. I used to believe that the energy I'll give these people It'll be duplicated because you'll go tell somebody else and he'll go tell somebody else and things will kind of like uh, organically grow. And that's basically how this kind of like everybody I've met uh, from the most successful people to just average Joes has been from just just the, just the personal, just me being me. You know what I'm saying? And I, I don't know. I just think that's kind of like the cool thing where you can be yourself and you can have success and you don't have to be a character of any sort. No. That's awesome. Man. Wow. Yeah. Now, let's get to the real important issue here, Maurice. Fucking squat at 870. You have any, <laughs> do you have any plans? Because you're looking pretty jacked to me, man. You, you, you want to do any kind of competitions, all kind of satisfy no, a little I bit? I think we should get you in one of those old school meets. No, I, I went to an old school meet, but I could only stay for like a portion of the time. Uh, but I guess the, the, the cool thing about it is like I like lifting weights. That's the thing. Like, I don't like it, this is not like a, hey, you have to force this guy to lift weights. Like, I like lifting weights. Yeah, it's a pretty uh, cool thing to do. We love it too. Like, <laughs> I mean, I, now, look, I actually think it's a spiritual thing, right? Because, yep, like, I do, I agree, man. from a spiritual standpoint, they say, like, you're in the here and the now. You're like, you got to be in the moment. Meditation, yeah, right? Yeah. Starting the day off, putting effort into something. I just think, like, pushing the bar up or, or locking in to, like, I got all this damn weight on my back and I got to push it. You know what I'm saying? And I just, I, I love that and portion it's always of always objective. Like, Henry Rollins said, 200 pounds. Is always 200 pounds. They said it could have kicked you the real deal. The, the weight room <laughs> is the most, never fucking lie. It's to the you. most <laughs> honest place in the world. I love, I love that. Yeah, you know, people. You say, what do you lift? I ca- well, I pr- I'll probably do about. And no, there's no. You probably do. And you know <laughs> or you don't know. Like there is no like. I could I maybe like, bench 300. <laughs> no, you can't. Have you done can. it before? It's, it's like, like Yoda. <laughs> do or do not. Yeah. No try. Uh, no. And that's why I love the weight room. It is the most honest place. You can't lie about anything no. under the weights. Like they tell the story for you. You know. <laughs> but, but I, I tell you what. I, I, I listen to me. I, when I say I love it, like I just love. I'm like a like play like this. I'm like the a me head. I hate to say it, but I'm just like a guy who just get up under the bar. I push. I play like this. I probably stay in the weight room all day if I could. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But yeah. I just enjoy it. Now, I tell you like this. I, I wouldn't mind trying to like actually compete for one. You know what I'm saying? Uh, AJ, train him. We're gonna we're gonna train Maurice for a big time power meter or something. See what this guy can do. Yeah, I'll keep like, fun. Just come out and do the meet that, that uh, AJ's doing. Yeah. Oh no, the Denver they they they're a bit stronger than me. <laughs> but, like, yeah. if, if I if I gave about eight months, eight or nine months of serious, damn, I'll come out here and yeah. train. We'll get you ready for a meet. But if I ever get serious, I wouldn't want you to have to come out here. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, I retired three years ago, so I, you know, now for me, lifting is is more of a, just a daily process than a job, right? It's, it's so, um, but uh, we'll, we'll have fun. We'll have fun. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, you uh, you think that's about good, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll come out, too. All right, we get Mike we'll, we'll do the ollie lifting, too. We'll yeah. teach you snatch, snatch and clean jerk. They probably won't have a problem learning. No, uh, I got to feel it to be like, like this? Well, we <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> oh, that was like so 400 we, pounds. You probably experienced this a lot with Corey. Uh, we would, so, so we're talking about open, like, our own office facility. So basically we lift weights, but we brainstorm business, like, we're drawing. Because, I mean, that's where we want to be, so why not, like, have our meetings in the weight room, right? We're brainstorming while we lift. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's yeah. how you achieve presence have a better idea. Oh, and that's what, I mean, we just had a lead FTS. That's what uh, Dave has. Uh, he has his conference table for his meetings inside the gym. Inside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Leg presses, squat racks, small lifts, all surrounding. It's glorious. But yeah. so jealous of don't that. Don't they have signs where they say the brain is more active when you exercise? Yeah, the more he can move. Like, Doug swears by that. He does oh, not yeah. do his – He want, and when he needs an idea and wants to think better, he moves. Yeah. Walks moves. around, moves, uh, engage. Uh, Humans swear. are made to move, and when you move, you're being more human. I don't understand why in schools they've taken it out. They, I mean, they keep removing they, physical education. Because they think you know? the body's just carrying the brain around. They That's don't understand. Wrong. Yeah. That's wrong. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah. Well, you got something else you want to say? Sorry. Oh, no, I just always say the, the, the body is the servant of the mind. Boom. Yeah. Wow. James Allen, yeah. James, hey, by the way, we're going to link to all these books, folks. So if you're, you're busy, like, riding down, you miss a few. In the show notes, you'll be able to see a le- reading list, and I recommend you get the read. That's a great list of books. Yep. Uh, where can people find you? Website, Instagram, Twitter? Yeah, um, well, website is uh, Uh Twitter 
is actually Reese Claret 13. It has a blue check, R-E-E-S-E, Claret, C-L-A-R-E-T-T. And uh, my Instagram is Maurice Claret. I wasn't intelligent enough to make them all with the same <laughs> name. I, st- I screwed up, too. <laughs> some, some other Mike Bledsoe somewhere stole my name. Um, and on Twitter, I'm AJ Roberts 33 because AJ Roberts, someone registered it when Twitter first went live. They've never they posted it once, <laughs> and, and, and I'm not big enough yet to get that blue check, so I'm working on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to get there, AJ. <laughs> All right, guys, make sure you go over to barbellshrug.com, sign up for the newsletter, five-star review on iTunes, positive comments only. That's the name of the game. Thanks, Maurice. That was a pleasure. Thank you. Join the conversation every week after the episode over at barbellshrug.com. This is also where you'll find new episodes of Barbell Shrug, Technique Wad, Nuggets and Pearls, Barbell Business, Get Change, plus new articles every day on our daily blog, written by us, guests of the show, and some of the biggest names in strength and conditioning. So, go there and leave a comment now. Oh my gosh, wow, that's so cool. Yay, that's so awesome. Did you like this video? If so, subscribe to our channel and share this with your friends. And if you want even more free, awesome resources to help you reach your fitness goals, plus some updates that we only share over email, head over to barbellshrug.com and sign up for the newsletter.